Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Night Light. This is going to be a very exciting evening, but before we get started, I want to thank Ken Quiet Hawk for his amazing intro. He and his wife, Deborah New Moon Rising, are both native storytellers from the, I'm going to pronounce it right, hopefully, the Abenaki tribe. And they are providing the extension of an age old tradition that is quite amazing. And very exciting. And after reading the book that the two gentlemen we have on tonight have written, it, it more and more enhances how, how they are carrying on the memories of the ancients through their storytellings. And the stories are amazing and they're beautiful. Please check out their website, Ken's and Deborah's. Um, it's nativestorytellers.com. But tonight we've got these two wonderful gentlemen who have written a book called Iroquois Supernatural. And Mark is going to get into all sorts of amazing stories that um, that will kind of enlighten and and entertain, but hopefully also educate you about a culture and a tradition that, that has sort of stood the test of time, but is kind of in the shadows between the here and the now. So I'm going to bring Mark on. Evening, Mark. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Doing well. Breathless, but fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, you know, we've had a uh, nice little exercise uh, right before the show started. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, de- dealing with winter weather and uh, you know, he- heavy snow snapping off branches from time to time, uh, crumbling infrastructure in a major U.S. city. That, that was interesting earlier this evening. Co- other conference calls. Um, but you know, it's all building up to another uh, food show we have in the works. And we might be covering chocolate pyramids. At least we'll hear a little bit about that one. So. Yes. But, yeah, yeah this is... Um, um, but you know, I I look forward to uh, each show, and I think we're up to what sixteen, something like that. Yeah, so, so, yeah, six, sixteen shows, and what as we get into our fifth month. You know, so we're it, it's uh, been a terrific uh, four full months. So. <laughs> yes, it has. Yeah, but um, yeah, I so, said. Um, I actually attended um, a conference with one of our guests. Uh, that, that was the infamous uh, falling asleep on so, someone's shoulder. Uh, if I can get her to return, uh, I, I'm not going to have to bring that up, but you know, Mason was at that <laughs> conference. Uh, but that was, that was at a time when uh, you know, we'd kind of worked together on, uh, you know, like I was – Doing some behind-the-scenes things, and you know, it, it was before he um, 
you know, made his you know, big debut on you know, a History Channel uh, show. So, you know, he didn't know we uh, what each other looked like. So, you know, so we didn't have a chance to actually meet. But uh, we were in the same at the same Chillicothe Hope Hopewell conference a couple years ago. But you know, this is going to be an important show where you know we tie information uh, together from a couple um, uh, guests. You know, uh, when Lon Krieger was on with us, uh, it was kind of like one of the earlier shows. Um, he spoke about <clears throat> the uh, evolution of horticulture in the Western Great Lakes region, uh, with you know with the Menominee tribe, and when Deanne Weimer was uh, with us, um, what two, three weeks ago. Um, she discussed her involvement with the Susquehanna uh, River Archaeological Center in Waverly, New York, and our guest Mike Bestine and Mason Winfield have an insightful book on the uh, history traditions, as well as a travel guide to the Iroquois from the eastern side of the Great Lakes. So I, I think we're going to hear, you know, maybe a little bit of contrast, maybe some similarities uh, around this you know, northern part of the United States region. And th- th- this uh, really interesting book is entitled Iroquois Supernatural, and, uh, and it, it's uh, published by Inner Traditions. You can get it there and Amazon. So, um, welcome, Mike and Mason. Thank you, Rob. Hey, we're here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and, uh, this is Mike, it's a full and house. Uh, thank you for having us on. Cool. Yeah. Th- 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 thanks for being here. So, how's uh, everything north of me and west of Barbara? Well, I'm right next to Mike, New York, and you know, New York is where most of this takes place. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm real close to their home base. Yeah, and uh, Mike, how's everything in Buffalo? Everything is doing well. Uh, we've had a fairly mild winter so far, which um, I don't I don't complain about. As as winters get older with me. Um, I don't mind the snow not piling up so deep and enjoying a little more indoor time, but um, it's been an, a good winter so far. Okay, good, good, good. And, uh, Mason, have you uh, been able to get out and do, do some of your uh, ghost walks or, or maybe more ghost walks since the winter is not as bad? No, we don't do them in the winter. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is this is Buffalo. You don't do an outdoor <laughs> walking tour business in the winter, you know. <laughs> I know you guys aren't from here, but I got to break it to you. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought you know maybe, maybe you could squeeze in an extra one, uh, extra one. But yeah, uh, how about the uh, lectures in, in the libraries? Uh, do you, do you oh have... well, yeah. I I can do as many of those as I want. Um, okay. I, I get a lot of calls and stuff. And uh, I was teaching a course on the paranormal at a community college in Batavia, which is about an hour from where I live. And that's been really fun, but mostly I'm working on the book. Okay, cool. Uh, you know, we will talk about that, that book and you know, m- more of your works as uh, we go throughout the evening yeah let's uh touch on iroquois supernatural really really like this one um and you know you're really focusing on a large portion of the eastern u.s uh but the iroquois uh core was in new york um like what what's the uh, time frame of you know, the Iroquois Confederacy. 
Yeah, this is. Uh, if, if, can I handle this, one, Mike? You know, the, the the white historians, and I don't mean to criticize, but the white historians um, tend to be conservative. And I don't mean politically, but they're time mm-hmm. conservative, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like if you didn't find anything before 1600, you presume, okay, that's when it started. But there's a big development curve, you know, behind something that is developed. There's There's a big curve behind it. So in my opinion, the Iroquois Confederacy is at least a thousand years old. And I think it might be a bit older than that. So, yeah, and 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 the answer isn't super simple because, you know, um, when do, when were the Romans Romans? You know, um, when were the Chinese Chinese? When were the Germans German? You know, it's like there's a point at which a culture sort of starts to take shape, and then there's a point at which it's already there, and uh, you know. So I'm sorry to waffle. But I'd say 1,000 to 1,200 is my feeling for the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, you know, uh, De- Deanne, you know, like you said, you know, like you said, um, you know, there, you know, just different stages of, you know, you know, you know they emerge into a fluorescence and. Uh, you know there. You know there were other people. Uh, Dan thought that you know that there were other cultures mixed in, maybe uh, a little bit before that have, have made it really intriguing doing the archaeology in uh, Waverly, uh, because you know we just it it it, it is really mysterious about when people were. You know, in, in the area, who they were, and you know, who, who became, uh, you know, or, or you know, the, the groups of people who became part of the Iroquois Confederacy, and, and yeah, I know, I know where you're going, Mark. The yeah. big answer, whenever there's change in um, mm-hmm. in cultures, the the big question is, did it come here or did it grow here? And, you know, in other words, is this due to a new group of people coming in? You know, this change that we might consider Iroquois in lifestyle, the longhouse, attitudes about the supernatural, the afterlife, burial customs, lifestyle. Did, did it come here or did it grow here? And, and with the Iroquois, the, the big answer tends to be yes. You know, it looks like it's both. There was cultural influence from other parts of the state. Oh, or other parts of the Northeast, and there was also um, possibly an immigration. But yet, but yet the fundamental um, DNA of the Iroquois and people we know now is the, the Paleo-Indians, Paleo-Americans of mm-hmm. uh, this part of New York State. So they've been here a mighty long time. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's kind of after, like with the migrations, you uh, you know, it's, I have to wonder if you know, the people arriving uh, were in much larger numbers and absorbed like some of the smaller uh, communities, and you know, that that could have happened. Um, you know, so it's just it, it, it's you know she, she you know when she she was on with us a couple weeks ago she you know she did mention some possibilities that have made her, her work uh, really you know. It's just mysterious, but it, it, it is also fascinating. So, I'm just can well, I that's ask, that's sort of a summary of history, here? you know, mysterious yeah. and fascinating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what was it that 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 sort of precipitated the forming of the confederation? Was there a, a reason for it, or did they just decide to get together so they were bigger than everybody else? We better turn this one over to Mike. Okay. Yeah, Great. there were uh, a number of factors which precipitated to bring the Confederation uh, to a point where it had to take a form. Uh, it took years. Um, the the estimates that I hear were between five and ten years, and it had. Uh, 
a person who came across the Great Lake in a stone canoe and landed on the shores of uh, northern New York. And this individual visited with the, the groups that were residing in that location. And as he made contact, he professed to them a doctrine with the teaching that expressed unifying on a spiritual level. So as he made his tour around what's known as New York State, he began to convince each group to come together and unify. When he had most of them on board, they said they were having issues with this very powerful being that lived just outside of the Adirondack. And as they conveyed their story, this man who they now refer to as the peacemaker, he came to the groups of people and said, this is what we're going to do. You each go back to your villages and make a gift. And when we go to visit this very powerful being, we will address this being and we will gift him these gifts that you've made for him. Because the stories that were told about this man is that he was not just powerful, but he had snakes in his hair. And if you got too close, he would entice you to get closer and he would kill you. And then he would cannibalize the people who came too close. And those stories spread. And everyone referred to this as the evil Todadaho. And when the peacemaker came to speak to this evil Todadaho, he brought the delegations from the five nations with him. And as they had conversation, the peacemaker had each one of the delegates bring their gift and offer it to this evil Todadaho. While they were conversing, someone went and started to brush the Todadaho's hair, and the snakes came out. And as they had more conversation, the Todadaho started to cry. And the peacemaker looked at him and questioned him. He said, the stories I've heard about you, he said, it doesn't fit that you would be crying. And he asked him, he says, why are you crying? And the evil Todadaho said, I've never been treated this way. And for them to give him gifts, it changed his heart. And from that point on, they grouped together and they said to this Todadaho, we want you to be our leader. So all of these groups that had chiefs and leaders turned that authority over to this man and they dropped the evil off of his title. And he's just known today as the Todadaho. And so because of this unification, they became one of the most powerful groups in the Northeast. And they spread this information out to the other neighboring nations And they started to expand and say, we will show you how this works, and we will come to your aid if you ever need assistance.
So the Confederation became very powerful before the Europeans arrived on this land. But it was not an overtaking of the neighboring nations. It was an expansion that they all agreed to. So each of the neighboring nations still conducted and followed their own teachings and, and doctrine, but they also knew that they were in alliance with this confederation. So this is why it became such a powerful element in the Northeast. And it's actually the model that was used to set up when Washington, George Washington, was trying to establish a government. He recognized in the different families that the Haudenosaunee in Europe occupied a huge territory, and he wanted to know how they were able to do that. So he sent a delegation from his core group to speak with the Haudenosaunee people, and they, they said, this is what we do. This is how it works. And they actually took the specifics of the structure of the Confederation, and they used that as a model to make to the Constitution. So this is why things are so key to how the system works. And it would still work today if the Haudenosaunee would continue to follow the rules that they established so long ago. But so it because was, it, it, of the election, sure, go ahead. No, so it wasn't a political connection. It was a spiritual connection, which makes it stronger. Yes. yes. Gotcha. But along with the spiritual connections, you have to have the, the ability to handle the what we refer to today as the political issues, but they have to be brought in in balance so that one is not dominant over the other. And that's how that structure works within the Confederation. Wow. Thank, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this, that, that you know, history is intriguing. And, you know, Mike you know, really got my attention with the uh, – Person arriving from the west in the stone canoe. Uh, what d- does the stone canoe r- represent? Well, it sounds not like a real oxymoron. Uh, it is, but again, when you start to see the talents or the abilities of a man in the stone canoe is that he basically was not following the laws of physics and not following the logical kind of structure in life. So when someone can do something like this and then unify people who were continuously in conflict, and bring them together without violence. This was the model that was supposed to be used for the European Union. And unfortunately, they would fall back on to the, the behavior from what their experiences were, which was to develop a very powerful army use technology to devise weaponry. Because along with that structure, um, one of the stories that has come out of the peacemaker's journey was that he brought them together in central New York, which was Onondaga. And he instructed all of those five nations to bring their weapons to that location 
where they dug a huge pit in front of a white pine tree. And he instructed them to bury all their weapons that were used for killing humans. And they did this. They buried that. And he told them to go back to their community and make new weapons and only use it for hunting. And that was being followed until the Europeans came in. And they had to defend themselves. Wait a minute. <laughs> Everybody's picking on the white guy these days. <laughs> well, um, this is Mason. Um, you know, the Iroquois were, were not behind the, the ball when it came to fighting. They were pretty good warriors, and um, they were respected and admired all throughout the Northeast for their abilities at defending their own turf. So whatever they did worked out all right. <laughs> Mike and I are in the same room. We're in my living room by a fire, and so we get to make eye contact when we <laughs> when we talk. You know, yeah, yeah. So you know, we get to pass off. Okay, hey, uh, uh, Mason, is the, the Iroquois Confederacy the, the uh, uh, people or you know, the characters we find? In the um, you know, James Fenmore Cooper's, you know, uh, what was it the the, the Leather Stocking Tales and the Last of the Mohicans? Is th- that this group of people? Uh, in my understanding, well, he's in he's in um, Iroquoian territory, mm-hmm. and I use that to mean a language family. But you know, the Mohicans. I think they're an Algonquin group, Mike. Am I right about that? The Mohicans are an Algonquian? Yeah. I believe they are. But everything that was outside of the Iroquois Confederacy was connected to the Algonquian group. And within that Algonquian group, there were many nations, and I believe the Mohicans were one of the, the groups that were included as being recognized as part of Algonquin. Yeah, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm I'm a little rusty on my James Fenimore Cooper. Magua, you know, the great villain. Um, Magua, in the movie, he claims he's a, a wait, he said he claims he's a Huron kidnapped by the Mohawk, but I just don't remember the text. But it would have made a big difference because if he was an Iroquoian, and first of all, <clears throat> I don't think slavery you know, I think there was indentured servants and stuff like that, but Mike, slavery didn't really exist in the Northeast, did it? Not as it's known as the slavery that we're familiar with, but when someone or a group of people would um, absorb another group, most of the time they were accepted as equals. But there were rare occasions that I have heard that they were they they almost had to earn the equalization. Yeah. So through the earning of equalization, they had to do the more laborious act around. But once they complied and they were a part of that system, uh, that absorption probably took place within that first generation. And, and for sure, their children, from what I've read about. And that's a lot like the Roman Empire. That was where they sort of did it too. I mean, you had to like pay your dues. You didn't, you know, you didn't come in as the as the head coach. You know, you didn't come in as the chairman of the board. You sort of came in, you know, as a rookie. Um, but that's just my understanding of, of what I've read about the Northeast, and I think Mike's um, Mike's understanding would be uh, considerably more profound. And the reason why it was structured or or handled that way is because. The slavery that we're familiar with, the way it was structured, it, it's a violation to the creator's understanding of life, that no other human has that authority or power, even though they may claim to have the physical ability to do it, doesn't make it right. And that's the concept that we're still intact with using a system that says we will absorb them and they will become equals with us. 
but they have to earn their place. And it was not structured in the way that you say you shackle them, you, you mistreat them, and you degrade them as humans. Uh, that was never a part that I have ever heard from any of the, the Native uh, peoples across the continent. <laughs> well, well, in the Northeast anyway, let's, let's stay there. <clears throat> I should, t- should tell you, this is Mason with a little bit of a co- winter cough. The, um, the Longhouse people were great adopters. It's like when they went to war with a, a society, if it was more than just a woofing match, I mean, if they actually had to take over some territory, the people were generally adopted into the Iroquoian nations, and they were treated pretty well. And it added to um, it added to the society. Um, and you know, um, I'm a, more of an expert on upstate New York than than anywhere else. But I should tell you that during the time of the Revolution and the War of 1812, both of which were fought in the Northeast, there were a lot of uh, not only whites but also freed slaves living among or escaped slaves living among the Iroquoian nations. It was like they, they just found life a lot freer, you know, away from the European style society. Pardon me. But the, but the, the Indian way is so much more in harmony and attuned to the land. It, it is so much a more spiritual way of life. No, oh, Barbara, I'm going to stay. No, 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 Barbara. I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, before Mike gets into this, I got to tell you, we don't say Indian anymore. <laughs> oh, so, okay. All right. And All look, right. They can call each other anything they want, but we, we white folks, we don't use the I word. Uh, All um, right. What word do we I use? Think, I think Native American. Well, I don't know. I, I Native American, or, you know, whatever they prefer. The, I mean, Mike doesn't care. He's my buddy. These people. <laughs> Wait a minute, that may be a little, that may be a little on PC too. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, Barbara. I've been wising off, and I've completely forgot where we were going. Maybe I should shut up and let Mike say something. Well, okay, well, Indian is not offensive um, because the story that Mad Bear had told about yeah. how the native people here got their name, being called Indian. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a pretty interesting story, which it should be in the history books. But it it is, but it's it's a misdirection. And Mad Bear used to say, he says, well, how did we get our name Indian? And everybody would raise their hand and say, well, the history books tell us that Columbus was looking for a trade route to India, ah, yeah. and and that's how that confusion came about. Well, Mad Bear made this statement forty um, some years ago. When I was out in Arizona with him, and he said, in 1492, there was no country on planet Earth called India. <laughs> and as soon as he said that, I said, you're right. And, I, and he said, well, what was it? I said, it was Hindustan. He said, how did you know? I said, well, hey, look, don't confuse that with me being smart. I said, that was the only year in high school that I had interest in the class of the ancient names of these countries around the world and that's why I knew it was Hindustan and he said well then how do we get our name and I said I don't know it's written in the book so he said I'll tell you he said I asked permission to go to Spain and look in the archives of Columbus's law and they granted him permission and he took two translators one spoke Italian and one spoke Spanish and he told them what he was looking for. He said, I need to see that there's a reference in Columbus's love to the people who he had met. And sure enough, the Spanish translator came up and said to him, I found it. He said, in, in Spanish, the word deal is God. Oh, wow. And he said, in this context of this phrase, Columbus is referring to the people who he had met as Indio. In. And he said, as it translates into English, he said it meant that they were in with God. And so he asked the Italian translator to do the same thing. And he found a very similar reference 
But he said it wouldn't translate exactly into in the God, except that they were God like. So hearing that, it makes me go, why is it so difficult? Because Ned Bear wrote letter after letter to the state education board <laughs> to change the book to tell the truth. And they told him it was too expensive to reprint the book that way. And he said, you don't have to do it today. He said that when you reprint this revised edition, he said that's when you make the change. And they said, we can't do it because it's already been established. It hands us down so long that we can't change it now. Well, <clears throat> that goes right along with what I was trying to say, that that those that were here were one with the land. They were more spiritually oriented. They were more in in harmony and peace with not only each other, but, but with the energy of the earth. And... Well, so that, yeah, they probably were, Barbara, than the Europeans of the same time. But, I mean, don't forget, this is Mason speaking, something Mike will tell you freely. I mean, Mike gives talks to uh, large uh, white audiences, and he'll say, don't look at us Native Americans like we're um, gods or geniuses. Or he says, look, you guys, your ancestors, had what we've got a couple thousand years ago. It's just that you lost it. You know, and, yeah. and my ancestors, you know, the old, the old scalds, the bards, the, the druids, they, they had their own um, form of wisdom, which probably would have knocked our socks off right now. And um, the, the difference is that Mike's people, they preserved it, for which I'm uh, uh, immensely grateful. Well, yeah, that's what I was getting at, that when the Europeans came, they, they really didn't take the time to learn what it was they yeah. were coming up against. They just assumed yeah. they were, they were, you know, uneducated and very barbaric almost. And yeah, I think a little bit of that is a, is a combination of, it's a tag team. I, I look at the currents of history and try to figure out why it got so, why it got the way it did. And I look at what happened in Northwest Europe, you know, and I see a tag team coming in of the Roman empire, which had its own ideas and Christianity which I'm not planning to blame, you know, but yet you, you had these two ideologies, these two forces that were dramatically different from indigenous, uh-huh. the indigenous Germanic speaking people, the indigenous Celtic speaking people. And, and really a lot of the screw up comes when these two influences that are not native, they're not native to that region. And they, they come in and they impose kind of a way of thinking and ideology and um, I, th- I think this wasn't entirely positive, you know? No, you know what's interesting? This is, this is Mike. Um, what was interesting is when I look back at some of the ancient world atlases that you will see the Roman Empire uh, mapped out in the atlas. And after they removed uh, the man that was uh, noted as Christ, once he was removed, It took a short time, but the Roman Empire now became the Holy Roman Empire. And now the agenda had changed completely to just not to remove and kill cultures as it went. It was to bring with them, uh, I guess what you would say is the crusade to tell the earth they all had to follow now what the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire agenda had in mind for the rest of the world. And that's where, unfortunately, we don't have good enough clarification through historians to say, uh, this is a misnomer that we have to break or tell the truth about to say that agenda was for a certain geographic location. And that's where it should stay. But they pushed it out beyond the boundaries and saying, this is for everyone. So the new ones that were forced into it in Europe brought the same behavior that happened to them to the North American continent. And so it, it actually happened to the European people first. And then they brought that mentality with them. And we're trying to address these things to say, we all have made mistakes in our lives. 
But at times, we do so as you say, to say, let's not continue to take them into the future. Let's reevaluate where they're going and say, this is what we need to work on collectively. Well, I agree with you. I think we all should, so should rewrite our history books, but, you know, that's not going to happen anytime soon, it feels like. But that's the appropriate thing. No, to but do. I think the cosmos will help rewrite those for the, uh, I guess you would say the dysfunctional uh, people who are in charge of things. Uh, the cosmos wants the highest good for all the humans. And it doesn't have any agenda hidden. It just says we want everyone to be good and understand. Couldn't and, agree more. Yeah, and and what, um, I think it was Mason talking a few minutes ago. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you know, there's uh, a little discussion about. Uh, you know, when uh, communities were uh, ab- absorbed into a- another one, it, it was you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, fairly well treated. You know, uh, you know, being seen as uh, equals, uh, but all, uh, during that. Uh, a section of the uh, discussion. Um, there was, you know, just you know, the focus was on um, the well-being, you know, the, the the well-being of uh, other people, uh, you know, different people, and you know, when you know, we look at um, you know about this. Uh, Right after, I, don't know, I think I think it was around the time of the War of eighteen twelve that uh, Mason mentioned, um, and in in uh, Ohio uh, th- there was you know the story of Blue Jacket where when he, he was just a colonial uh, a white kid that uh, you know, just kind of ran away and uh, wanted to. Uh, be part of uh, the Shaw- I think it was the Shawnee. Um, yeah, they uh, were in Ohio. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I I don't have the book in front of me, but uh, yeah, there is that story where you know the, the you know he he got more uh, and you know there was a, a lot more of the uh, you know journals from that time period where um, you know a lot. A, a, a lot of the uh, uh, white people who uh, m- you know, m- may have uh, gr- grown up in you know the colonial America uh, e- ended up um, uh, being uh, like kept in pr- as a uh, like a POW type uh, situation after some, some skirmishes. Uh, you know, they didn't want to go uh, back after uh, peace treaties. So, you know, it really says something about uh, you know, uh, also what Mike has said about um, the spirituality, um, you know, having compassion and you know, there, there wasn't uh, a, a lot of that as prevalent prevalent in the colonial cultures. Uh, so I, I, hmm. Yeah, it, it yeah. goes back to the, the uh, name of the you know what Mike was talking about with the um, name of um, uh, where the word Indian derived from. Mhm. Well, it's just I, you know, you, you, there there are other stories out there. I was just trying to relate uh, so, something else to get, give a little bit more recent supportive evidence. Sure. Yeah, you know, this is Mason speaking. Um, 
I don't call myself a historian because I'm not, I don't have a degree in history, but I do try to try to make sense of the big picture and consult original documents. And I, I just have to tell you injustice, uh, brutality um, that's existed in every part of the world, every, every known society. And um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think we should portray as much as I admire the native American people that I know, and the ones I know from history, I don't think we should portray them as these saints that, you know, all the evil came from another shore. I mean, I, I don't want to get, get negative here, but when you research some of the societies, particularly the Mesoamerican ones and even the Andean cultures, you see that, you know, so the white guys get here and exploit them, but a lot of them were doing it to each other. Um, it, it's It's just what I'd like to try to figure out about history is, how do we avoid the mistakes we made in the past? How do we find compassion? How do we find, you know, how do we try to up- uplift the planet, uplift all life? That's what I'm personally, that's what I'm working on, you know? So that's my two cents with. You know, there, you know, every culture has, you know, there's skeletons in the closet. Um, you, know, you, you just look at the archaic, you know, uh, uh, Indian no, you know, the Indian no book by Dr. Webb, and he he covers uh, t- some of the people in that that Kentucky mounds uh, were probably oh, yeah. sacrifices. Oh but yeah, you also, you also have Hope this, well. yeah, or the the archaic people, and then you know you go to uh, you know. Uh, those uh, like Dutch bog bodies uh, at, at about the same time as the Hopewell, and you know they're uh, the uh, muck in those ponds preserved the bodies really well, and you can see the uh, gashes in people's necks. It's like everyone's made uh, uh, some mistakes, and. You know, the, you know the you know the different ways of worshiping some some god. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry to take us that direction. I I I believe that um, I, I I I try to avoid stereotypes. You know, I try to try myself just to look at at people in their in their entirety and to to look at the good in, for instance, the Iroquoian societies. And mm-hmm. I think this is a lasting tradition of spirituality for for the world and that that which is still being preserved by people like my friend and co-author Mike Bastine and by the elders by the culture keepers of the the northeastern Native American societies that I know and uh, you know that's just for me that's that's what I kind of like to focus on is what the world needs to hear from what guys like Mike has to tell them well and you know thing you know so, some practices were done for a while and they didn't work, and that you know they they, they changed and um, you know it's just uh, um, every culture has been been like that. Yeah, yeah. Every world society's had episodes. I mean, you look at the witch trials in Europe. I mean that that was not something that you'd say. Well, the English do this, the Germans do this. It was kind of an episode, and uh, an extremely uh, disappointing one. But um, and uh, you know, I think um, it's entirely possible that the uh, the rituals that we have unfortunately <laughs> started talking about <laughs> in in the uh, Hopewell and Adena societies could have come up from Mesoamerica. They could have mm-hmm. been due to cultural conflict and they could have come up with corn. They could have come up with uh, some of the uh, religious practices. So, you know, it's, it's entirely possible. This was not something indigenous to the uh, native societies of, uh, of the, uh, the Mississippi Valley, the Ohio Valley, you know, and, and I don't think there's evidence of anything like that among the Iroquois people either. I think, you know, they were no angels, but you know, they, as far as anyone knows, they weren't doing, you know, mass sacrifice. Yeah, and you know, early on in uh, Iroquois supernatural, you know, both of you do discuss um, 
and you, know, you just you, uh, just mentioned it. Um, you know, the sudden appearance of agriculture, and you know, the long long houses. Uh, you know, when we had um, Lon uh, Krieger as as a guest, you know, he was discussing the uh, ancient garden beds of Michigan. Uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, it's just an interesting topic about the uh, sudden appearance of um, agriculture, and you know what you're saying about the the corn. You know, where did that come from? Is that you know, probably Meso, probably Mesoamerica. <clears throat> but see, the mm-hmm. trick is that. Cultures change when they get new technology, um, even if it's food technology, they, they, they change. And, um, you know, behavior you're going to see among hunter-gatherers, um, it can be very different than the cultural behavior you see when they become more sedentary, they become farmers, and they become urbanized. And, and these are all, all changes that uh, – that occur, yeah, I think. Mike, have you ever heard anything about that? I think the, the corn came up from, from like, Mexico, right? It did, yeah. What's interesting is to go back briefly to those archives where Man Bear was looking. <clears throat> he also gave another experience which never hits the history books. And he said in reading through the log that they were doctoring Columbus's crew because they were sick from drinking stagnant water and rancid food. And when they arrived uh, in the island, they were sick, and the people who welcomed them were doctoring them back to health. When everyone was back to health, they threw a feast. And on the platters of food were tomatoes. But in Europe at that time, the tomatoes were still the nitrate family. And unfortunately, Columbus saw that, and he believed that they were trying to poison his people, and he ordered the suffering of the hands of the surgeon. Now, when I heard Mandir tell this story, it tells me that there's a psychosis amongst the people with Columbus. And why would a group of people doctor you back to health to kill you? Which makes absolutely no sense at all. But this is the fear that resided within those people. And they believed, excuse me, they believed that this is uh, something that a group of people would actually doctor you back to the so that they could kill you. And he said, there was many comments around that. And he said, the psychosis was evident that they really were not ready to go out into the world to meet people different than them. Come on, Mike, that's a classic rope dope <laughs> You know, like they set them up, set them up with kindness, you know. Come on, buddy, I thought you guys would have known that. I don't know. Right. But when he said that, that was nightshade, it shows that the agricultural element within the, these other people mm-hmm. had taken things on another level and said, let's convert things that may not be Um, healthy for us to eat. Let's see what we can do with them to alter their basic primal form and turn it into a food. So potatoes, tomatoes, there are many plants now that provide edible fruit or food which derived from or came from a nightshade strain or, or species of base plant. And that's why you seeing things like this, uh, it, it tells you that there's a 
higher function within another group of people, even though they're not focused on that element, it's, it's already a pattern built into how they live life. And, Mike, how um, prevalent is uh, the use of, what, the Algonquin uh, language and, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, Corn and you know, horticultural you know, uh, um, uh, what we say, uh, pra- practices uh, survived, but ha- how 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 well is you know, the use of the language uh, sur- surviving in today's world? It's strained and difficult, but the Algonquin language has many dialects and most are still intact. The reason that there was a, a, uh, I guess a separation or a division of the groups of people between Algonquin and the Haudenosaunee is because during that time when groups would make alliances, it was all language-based uh, alliances and the Haudenosaunee languages were not understood by the Algonquin people. So that's what divided uh, the people. Because I had even asked Mabir, because Mabir told me that the Algonquin people were about 10 times larger than the Haudenosaunee people. And I said, then why wasn't there an alliance? And he said, because of a language barrier. But he said it is a, a more historical event that they just did not get along. <clears throat> and so the Algonquian people were not known as great warriors. And they were more of a group of people who just, they had larger numbers than the Confederacy. And I guess in one of the last battles that uh, the Haudenosaunee talk about, that they were outnumbered 10 to 1. And the Haudenosaunee people defeated them. <clears throat> and because of that, they've stayed in their own group. But when the European element came in, and both sides started to uh, lose their position, it seems that there was kind of a unification then between the Algonquian people and the Haudenosaunee. But it, it, it's not anything that's in writing. It's not like a treaty or a written alliance. <clears throat> but they knew that they had to work together to try to stand and survive their own position. Uh, this is Mason speaking. You know, that's one of the saddest stories in history when the uh, Native Americans of the Northeast finally got it together and they realized that their real enemy was not each other, but it was the Europeans. Because every battle I've ever looked up in the Northeast, um, whether it was British fighting Dutch, fighting French, fighting Americans, both sides had Native American allies. The Native Americans were in on everything that was going on up here. And um, it, it was like the, the territory of the Northeast was, I mean, you think about it, it was very heavily forested, hard to find a way around. And the, the white guys would make a deal with one Native nation to go after another. And um, and then the native nation that the that one group of white guys like maybe the the Dutch was was after they would make an alliance with the French and it it was um, you know it's it's sort of the way the world works but it's it's tragic and when you see for instance the way the the War of eighteen twelve developed 
stopped. A lot of Native American people fought for the British Empire in the War of 1812 against the United States. And they did that because they thought they might be able to get to keep their lands. And, you know, I don't know whether the British would have ever kept that deal or not. Um, history will never, will never tell us. You know, you get the feeling it would be a little bit like development right now. You know, a deal is good for like 30 years or so, and then it changes. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's like I, – because I, I have researched that war. I wrote a book on that war, and it was just tragic to see the way Native American people risked everything to try to back the British Empire, and uh, it, it all fell apart, you know. So, anyway, hey, we're, we're getting on a glum pathway here tonight. And, and Mike and I are happy people. Maybe there's something you could guys could bring up that would be a little happier to talk about. Okay. Uh, how about uh, what was the uh, role of the little people in the Iroquois uh, folklore and histories and you know, uh, spiritual belief system? Yeah, you know, that's a very interesting um, area of life because we're going through right now in this area, they're making preparations to do what they refer to as the midwinter ceremony, which acknowledges all the elements of the culture. So they right now are preparing. Some people have already done this where they feed false faces. And the best thing is the honor of being into the midwinter ceremony, the honoring of the Lucy. And there are different societies. And they refer to them sometimes as the, the small water society, or I think it's referred to as the dark dance. Uh, there's many references to the little people. <laughs> What's interesting is one of the members of the society had told my friend Ted, he said one of the little people actually told him in a ceremony, he said, you know, we're not all good. And so we have to keep our vigilance and keep aware that in dealing with these other groups, there are factions within them that aren't good. It seems to be just the structure of life that some have to take the dark side and some have to take the light side. And that's why some of them have told these members of that society that we're not in the good. Which was interesting because we like to think of these elements of life that they're here just for all good. And sometimes we hear the medicine people speak about the little people as being very beneficial and sometimes being very mischievous. And the ones that like to be mischievous can actually do harm. So working within this structure, they have to be recognized for which ones that you can trust and the ones that you have to be aware of. So they do fit still into the culture and they are recognized every year during this time that they call the midwinter ceremony. Because at this time, the rest of the life around us has gone to sleep. The plants, the insects, all of the things that typically are very active, they've gone to sleep, and it's now the time to dedicate to taking care of these other elements in life. Mike, I never knew you met someone from the Dark Dance Society. You've been holding out on me. <laughs> That's a highly secretive society. 
Mike probably knew that I would be curious and that they would never talk to me. So, but wow, that's cool. Yeah. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, things and I guess it's, I look at it now as it's not happenstance. It didn't just happen by chance. It has happened for a really good reason, but I usually keep that kind of quiet until I see why it will fit into and how I need to treat things that are kind of looked at as being sacred and recognize that I have to respect all of these things that uh, are considered sacred. You know, at one point, Matt there asked me to reach up in his closet and pull this little glass container down, but it was wrapped in a red box. I brought it down. He unwrapped it and opened it up. He took the lid off, and there was a small human skull inside. It was about three inches tall, and it had the full set of teeth in it. And Mander pointed all these details out to me. And he said, this was found in central New York while they were excavating for the Erie Canal. And he said, it was an authentic little people's fault. So I know there's still things that are in existence, but no one photographs them. No one leaks out these things into public. Because it's a sacred element to them. And if they violate the sacredness of this, I believe it would cause a division and you would lose the support of the little people and the ceremonies would never be the same. Mike, I have heard that possibly... In the, I, I hate to use, use names, but I just got to call it like it is. Possibly in the Allegheny region, th- that the Seneca people might have had a clash with the little people in their area. And I have heard that possibly that famous supernatural hill they've got down there, Gahai Hill, um, its white name is Bay State Hill. But I had heard that this conflict may go back a couple generations. Have you heard anything like that? It's older than a few generations. And I was in Ohio uh, having conversations with some of the people who have been doing research and study around the mound that the little people were involved with destruction of the mound in along with the Seneca people. What happened is there was an act, and one of the two sons, the Seneca chief son, uh, did something reckless, and he killed accidentally one of the little people. And it was one of the sons of a very powerful leader of the little people. And because that happened, they couldn't come to terms. The little people leader asked that that chief or that leader of the Seneca people turn his son over to them to kind of replace the loss, but not forever. But the Seneca chief was reluctant to do that. And the rift became greater. And because of that, there's a, there's a lack of trust on both sides. And this occurred during that time when the construction of the mound was, was going on. Wow. That is so heavy. That is so similar to a lot of the t- traditions in Europe about the, the monuments there. The, you know, it's a stone hand. It, 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 that is so heavy. Hey, Mark and Barbara, you guys still there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're just oh, okay. yeah, I, say, I figure your... maybe Mike and I better go out to dinner so we can continue <laughs> <Yeah>. this conversation. <laughs> there we go, taking over the damn program, you know? 
Well, this the is the Mike and May show. You guys on point was to get you guys on and get you talking so that we could you, you could share some of this wonderful information with our audience. So you're doing a great job. Well, you're very supportive. I mean, Mike's <laughs> doing a great job. You guys are being very supportive. But um, I would like to try to be responsive to the questions that either Barbara or Mark has right now, too. Well, I think one of the things in reading your book that fascinated me the most, I mean, it, 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 I could resonate to it, a whole bunch of it, but the one that I really was fascinated with were, were the false faces. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that that to me is really, it's right up there with, with and the Europeans, no, no other world society has anything like that. You know, no. it's unique, absolutely unique, and it's so unique that I think I'm going to let Mike declaim right now because I think he's much more qualified than I am. I'm just a writer. You know, I heard a um, a recent, and when I say recent, it was probably 20 years ago, an account of one of the local farmers for the Haudenosaunee people. Uh, he grows the white corn that's used in ceremony. And one season, he he would take the harvest down to uh, Cattaraugus or the Seneca uh, people, and he said, I'm bringing down the corn that was ordered. So he would go to this elderly lady's house, and he would unload her corn first. Then he would leave his wife with this lady to visit and socialize. And he would drive up on the reservation to deliver the corn to the other people that uh, requested it. Some of the people would take extra corn. Some people would take a little less. And he came back to the ladies, and I had a couple of my braids of corn uh, left over. And he asked her, would you be interested? Would you like them? She said, yes. Well, when he first delivered his initial um, order of corn to this lady, he was taking it through the house and walking through a little hallway to go to the pantry. And in the kitchen, there was a faucet that stuck. It, it uh, was lower than the ceiling. It protruded down from the ceiling. And as he was peering the corner, he saw 13 faucets on this faucet. And he stopped and he started looking at each one because he had never seen. Such beautiful And he realized after looking at each one that he had spent uh, a lot of time. And I think the lady said something to him, is everything okay? And it kind of snapped him out of that. And he went back and put the corn there. So on his return trip, he. Um, Asked the elderly lady, would you like to let her raise the corn? She said yes. So he was taking the corn back through the same thing. And he looked in the kitchen, and the sausage was empty. There were no sausages. And he didn't see too much of it. So he went back and delivered the corn and put it in the pantry. And when his wife and him socialized a little more, they got in the truck. And he said to his wife, he said, well, you guys were really busy when I was gone. And she says, what are you talking about? He said, well, you must have gone back into the kitchen and removed all those faucets. And she said, no. We sat and socialized in the living room all the while you were delivering the corn. And then he realized, he had had an experience, and they had shown him to it, 
And he called his name, and he explained what happened. And she told him, she said, you have had one of the most incredible experiences for bringing the seed that feeds the false faces. They were on you to show themselves the 13 false faces for each week. And he said, you never see anything that you know, when he told the story, you'd cry. Because he was so emphatic about how what an incredible experience he had. <clears throat> and when he talked to his mom and she said, you are so blessed. She says, most people never get to see all 13 of the false faces. And when he said how beautiful they were, it really explained that they were honoring his work for bringing the corn that they would turn into the corn mash to feed the, the false faces. So when he told that story, I said, man, I've never heard anything like this before. And he was just a very humble, one of the nicest guys that you would ever want to meet. And I said, what an honor to hear the story told. And so, you know, the false faith element is all part of different societies. Matthew had two. Uh, he had the red one with the nose turned off to the side, which they uh, has a name called Hot Dewey. That one is the leader or the one that is the protector. He also had a corn pot cloth face with the mouth uh, like it was whistling. Uh, he said that too is a it's a notifier. It's something that it would um, give out warnings if something were happening. If you were a member of the society, uh, it would notify those members of the society that there were uh, things that they needed to be vigilant about or start to really pay attention. Something was coming. So in hearing the conversations, even with Mad Bear before I had met the man, his name, uh, by the way, that provided the corn, his name was Norton Rickert. And there's many documentaries about him. They haven't made a lot of uh, great, uh, I guess, distribution, but one of them is called The Gift. And The Gift is referring to the corn. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's one of these experiences that you see how everything is integrated and connected mm -hmm. to the spiritual components, to the life components, to the physical part of life, to the spiritual part of life, that we have to feed both sides. We have to feed the spiritual and we have to feed the physical. And so Mad Bear actually, you know, one of the more interesting stories that I heard from him was a reporter had come to visit him and kept staring at his hot chewy false face. And Ned there said to him, he goes, is there something that I can help you with? And he said, I'm just intrigued or taken by that red false face, that red man. And Ned there said, well, I'm going to ask you to stop looking at it. He said... You know, when you walk into a room and you start to stare at something, if they get uncomfortable, he said, my face is not comfortable with you staring at it. And the man kind of laughed and then they said, I'm, I'm serious. He said, these are living beings. He said, we treat them as living beings and we respect them as they are living things. So the the reporter wanted to know more, and Mad Bear said, "Well, I don't know if I should tell you anymore." He says, "You're you're not treating this very seriously." And the reporter said, "Look," he says, 
I'm sorry I offended you, and I'm sorry I offended your father. And Mander said, you know the hair that's on that ball thing? And it was hung fairly high on the wall. And the hair was probably about five or six feet long. And Mander told me the reporter, he said, the hair grows on the coffee. And now the reporter starts getting kind of silly again. He goes, man, and Mander said, I'll tell you what. He said, we'll go over there. We'll measure the hair. We'll measure the distance from the ceiling to the top of the ball tray. We'll make another measurement from the floor to where the hair is. And he said, and if you come back one year from today, we will redo these measurements. We'll write them. You write them down. He said, and we'll see if what I'm telling you is true. And sure enough, the reporter came back. They measured the hair. They checked all the measurements from the year before. And he goes, if you didn't see this and do the measurements yourself, he said, I wouldn't believe it. But he said, you're right. He said, the hair has grown about two and a half inches. So these are parts of the life which when I see and hear these things told and then it's verified, <clears throat> it tells me that there are other life sources amongst us. And maybe science can't detect it, but they exist. And these are the parts of life that we have to hang on to and we have to protect and treat as the most sacred part of life. Hey, this is Mason coming in. Um, I think I should have maybe even started this sequence because I've got to tell you, a lot of our audience, um, our listening audience, has no exposure to what the false faces are. Yeah. Um, many people <clears throat> may have seen them, but um, in essence... <clears throat> The false faces. And you're going to find that a lot of Iroquoian people, a lot of Native people, call them the medicine masks. They are generally made out of a wood called, it, it, it's called basswood. And it's, I think it's a variant maybe of, um, I'm out of my depth when it comes to woodology. But it's definitely basswood. It's the same type of wood that people make uh, carousel horses out of. It's a wood that's very nifty carved. But the Iroquoian people have a secret cult of healers called the Medicine Mask Society. And um, nobody really knows for sure who they are. And the leader of the Medicine Mask Society is always a woman. She's the queen of the, or well, I don't think call her that, but... That's a little uh, uh, ethnogenetic there. But at any rate, there is a woman who is the leader, the mother, that's what they call her, the mother of the False Face Society. And she's the leader of the group. And the False Face Society are basically um, shamanistic, indigenous healers. And they never operate individually. They're always in a group. And, you know, you, you don't go to, you don't call on the false faces when you've got a splinter in your thumb. You know, you don't call on them when you've got a, you know, a blister. It's like they come out as a group at times of, of societal need, you know, maybe once or twice a year. And um, the members of this society, the false face society, they're entitled to wear the masks. And the masks... Um, they have these distinctive long shocks of either horsehair or corn stalks. And uh, they look like the faces of just random goonies, but it's a heck of a lot more than that. I mean, every, uh, in every authentic false face mask you see, it's, it's a message, you know. And, and the coloring, they tend to be either black or red. And I think the red means that the mask was possibly made during the day, 
or it was inspired by a vision during the day and the black ones, it's at night. And when someone is destined to be a false faith healer, you know, a member of this secret society, um, they're often um, notified through a dream or a vision. The individual just feels like, whoa, I've had my calling. And then they walk into the woods and they, they stay there until they find their tree because there's a tree out there that um, is the one they're going to carve their mask upon. And so they start carving on that tree and they get the mask done to a certain extent on the tree. And then they take a chip out of the tree, you know, they take a plank out of the tree and this mask that they've been working on when they take that home with them and uh, they perfect it. The trick is, um, I mean, the tree cannot die. If the tree dies, it's, you know, you got to do this in a way that the tree lives. And another trick is that once they've taken this mask off the tree, they have to finish it. And if they don't finish it, they have to um, I don't know, purify it, but they've got to get rid of it in a sacred way. Mike, if, if somebody had to get rid of a false face, they – they made one, and they realized, I, I just can't go through with this. How would you get rid of that false face? Would you say that you'd, you'd burn it or you'd ritually – obviously, it's, it's in a ritual manner. If it was in process, it would be handed over to someone who could complete the mission. If there was no one available, they would have to go to that – uh, higher authority that could be the woman and to say this needs to be taken care of because we can't leave unfinished business with this society, with these masks because they're not just healing, they also are protectors and I heard a story just recently um, probably about five years ago <clears throat> with a young man who was in the woods experiencing a light emitting from a tree and it was connecting over to another tree in an arch and then from the tree that it was connecting to it shot straight up in the air and as he witnessed this, he called, <laughs> he called a friend and he told him what he was observing and what he saw. And the man that he called said, in the beam of light that went straight up, he said, in the space between the borders of the light, was there a zigzag light? And was that zigzag light moving up into the sky. And he said, yeah. He says, how do you know? And he said, that's the hot dewy representation in the non physical form. Well, when he told me the story, I started to piece things together, but I, I made a tobacco offering. And what came in was that the hot dewy are leaving. They're, these are the protectors. And I called him back and I told him, I said, I think this is very important information. And I said, because if the hot duties are leaving, it means that there is no protection being provided on this spiritual level. And I said, this is not a good sign because I have heard from the Hopi that when that comet hail box came through, mm -hmm. that the subpoenas that were in charge of manning the post on um, the poles, they also left. And these were beings that were put in place to protect the earth. So when I'm hearing things like this, the protectors are 
getting out of the way. It tells me that something is coming in to realign everything and fix the problem that the people aren't working on to do. And I said, the reason we need these people to stay involved, we need someone to call the casinos back and someone to call the hot food back once this event, which is coming, to realign and change the things that the humans don't even be able to do or are not going to do. So I believe that on the higher level of consciousness, we're going to get the best and the highest blessing from the cosmos. Even if the humans don't put the effort in to do it themselves. So when the protectors are voluntarily getting out of the way, that means there's another element coming in, another life force to realign and change the things that the humans aren't doing for themselves. Mike, you're freaking me. This is really <laughs> Wait a second. This is second coming. <laughs> turning and turning in the winding gyre of the falcon. You cannot hear the falconer. <laughs> Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Well, if I may um, try to become a little more adult, if I were to add a little something to the false face uh, discussion, I would say I, I really should have had me start because then I could give you the flat out background introduction for a mainstream audience and then Mike would, would go. That would have been better. We'll remember that for the next show, Mike. But <laughs> the the type of um power that these masks are thought to have. I mean it's a piece of wood with some carving, some paint and some hair on it. But yet it is they are widely regarded to have a type of power that you, you know, would, would translate as nothing other than magic. They are powerful. And I've talked to loads of people who aren't native, who've had experience with these false face masks. And, you know, the, the old stories sound like they're really true. I mean, museums that keep false face masks, crazy sounds, moving objects, um, sometimes disasters. Um, these, these artifacts are more than just pieces of wood. And if you understand a little bit about the, uh, the metaphysical philosophy of the Iroquoian nations, it, it, it's, not on, it's not alone in, in the world um, among societies to believe that there's a kind of a force out there you know, and and um, like the Egyptians called it called it Ka or Mat, the uh, Greeks called it Numa, the Anglo Saxons might have called it Wu, um, the the uh, Asian societies many of them would call it Chi. It, it's like this universal force of life. And for the Iroquoian people, the word used most often was Orenda, or some variant of it, Orenda. And Orenda, it's just power you know it's like electricity you know it's like gravity it's a, it's power it's neutral it's not you know hostile it's not it, it's power but when the power got corrupted oh well first of all the the power orenda could exist every living being has orenda to some extent um wizards and shamans have a lot more Orenda than most of us. Supernatural beings like the little people, you know, or many of the other um, uh, factors of Iroquoian um, supernaturalism, you know, supernatural beings have a ton more than, than people. The gods have a ton more of this force, Orenda. Um, the false face masks are very rich in Orenda. But see, the trick is, um, Orenda is a force. It's like fire. It's like wind. I mean, you know, I mean, you wouldn't say fire is good or bad. And you wouldn't say that it's, you know, that wind is good or bad. You say that it's a force. Um, well, anyway, though, 
because Orenda can get concentrated in objects like false face masks or crystals or there's a number of other things that can absorb this, this force. But sometimes the force goes negative. And they call that Atkan. And, and probably the difference is it's like if you're a healer and you want to help somebody, you're using Orenda in a good way. So it's like still Orenda. But if you happen to be a person who is starting to practice, you know, let's just kind of like say uh, <laughs> witchcraft, and you want to make something happen for you that is not in accordance with the natural plan, if you want to make something happen that is um, selfish, that may be vindictive, and you want to, you've mastered Orenda and you want to use it for that, well, now the name changes. It's, it's, it's Atkan. And um, Atkan is, is kind of a disruption in, in the use of Orenda. And honestly, the Star Wars films, you know, the, the, the use of the Force, mm-hmm. I, think, I think the Star Wars was probably inspired by Joseph Campbell. I know they had many inspirations. <clears throat> and, and their researchers, whoever they got researching and writing all that, was no dummy. They really did some homework. And, but, but at any rate, the, the masks have a lot of power. They have a lot of arenda. And uh, if you don't watch it with those things, your life could start to get screwed up. Okay. I, I have a question. Um, everything does have energy. The trees have spirits in and of themselves. When someone <clears throat> goes to create a mask, there is magic in the creative energy that actually creates the mask. So that would add to the energy of the mask itself, blending the create the creators, the creative energy with the spirit of the tree, with his spirit or her spirit, whoever carves it. Um, so does the creator of the mask have to be the one that wears it or, or, does it, can it be anybody who's just designated a healer wear them? Typically, yes, it would be the person because it's a commitment and a dedication not to just perform or go through um, this action. It's something that is lifelong. And uh-huh. that responsibility also falls on that individual when they're coming towards the end of their life to find people who they can hand these cere- The ones that have been in ceremony have been activated and have this power or ability to interact with those who know how to activate. Um <clears throat> There was a point in Nedbear's time when he became very ill. He wrapped his false faces in a sheet, and he gave them both to me, and he said, just put them in a safe place and don't bother with them, and they will be fine. And I did. I held them for him until he got through his health crisis, and when he returned home, I returned his false faces to him. So when you find someone that you can trust and you know that they don't do anything to harm or put those uh, false faces in jeopardy or not, in a safe place, um, it would have had really negative impact to me, and it also would have had a negative impact to my dad. So knowing how special, and I mean it was an honor for him to pick me to do that, but at the time I was so uninformed of the vastness and how special these false faces are, it was just, and maybe that's one of the reasons he picked me, because he knew I would not try to do anything 
other than put them in a safe place and leave them alone. You know, now they have um, to be, Mike, and they have to be fed oops. once a year, don't they? Yes. And if the individual is not well enough to care for them, they can hand them off to another member of the society and someone can do that caretaking for them. Yeah, and it's a complex ritual. I mean, it's not only the corn soup, but it's also the tobacco smoke, and Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's got to be some sort of tribute. You know, Mike, I'm going to tell just the briefest of tales, and you and I both knew who who I'm going to be talking about, and I don't want you mentioning the name, but this goes back about 10 years. I get a call from some people who – I'm, I'm telling this as an illustration of, of how much respect you need to use when you're dealing with these artifacts, that they really don't belong to a person. They belong to a nation, you know, league of nations. But anyway, um, I, I got a phone call. Uh, she actually called my office, but it ended up with me. Somebody wanted me to come out to their house and play Ghostbuster. And I would have said, I'm sending Mike, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm the white guy with a laptop. I'm not a ghost hunter, but um, it turns out that they thought that their house was uh, being cursed and that somebody was doing it to them. And, um, you know, I like to try to help people. So I, I, we do a little more talking. I'm trying to figure out what's going on and um, nothing's ringing a bell. <clears throat> this, this person just, she, just the way she presents with information is very hard for my mind to register it. You know, we, we start with point ten and we end up with point three and whatever. But anyway, it turns out that she thinks she's being persecuted and her family is being persecuted. And um, she wants me to do something about it. Ask a few more questions. She tells me where she lives. It's pretty close to a reservation. I go, do you guys live on a reservation? She goes, oh, yeah. I go, are you native? Oh, well, no. And she's telling me about this and that and this and that and all these problems. And I'm going, well, look, why are you calling me? Because, you know, you're so close to the reservation. You, you've got, there's the, you know, the, the Seneca have elders who know how to handle anything. You know, why don't you go to them? And, and then she goes, well, that's who I think is doing it. <laughs> I go, what? You know, you know, you've gotten the medicine people mad at you and you think I'm going to do something about it? do you have any artifacts in your house that maybe don't belong to you? And she goes, ah, nothing too much. You know, just like, uh, you know, the false faces. <laughs> I broke up laughing. I go, you got to give those back to the nation. You can't call somebody off the reservation and try to get them to do some magical interference for you. It turns out that somehow or other, a white family living on, living on or very near the reservation had come into the possession of some false faces sacred artifacts to, uh, you know, the Seneca nation. And they wanted to keep them because they were, they were economically valuable and they were probably planning on selling them. But, the, but all this stuff starts breaking out around the house. And I, I wouldn't touch this one with a 10 footer. You know, I told her, you know, look, you've, you've got to make your peace with the medicine people. You can't be reaching out for help with people who don't belong there anyway. Well, she didn't take my advice, and she ended up calling up a, a ghost hunter, and, uh, you know, apparently he, I don't know what the deal was, but he probably, <laughs> well, I won't delve into his motivations, but he went out to the reservation, and he tried to do a, some kind of a ritual to smooth things out, and it didn't go well. It's like he was tormented in his house, his, his wife became ill, he became ill, and only when he very loudly and clearly announced his renunciation of any involvement with the false faces did things improve it's like you you've got to um understand it and you got to respect it when it's not your tradition and when you don't know what you're doing and um you you, you got to stay out and 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 as far as i'm concerned false face uh the subject and the material they belong to the nations and uh you know I, I would just tell anyone, if you do happen to possess uh, a false face that's been used in ceremony, whose eyes have been opened, um, get it back to the, the people who uh, who rightfully own them. Because there there are cases where these items are in museums and they're in the possession of individuals, you know. And uh, anyway, I'm done for a while. 
were there not, was there not a museum where the there were faces that <clears throat> were not in um, the nation's archives or, or or museum and and a fire broke out and everything burned. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Faces? I I know of one incident. Yeah, I, I know Barbara. I know of one incident you're talking about. Um, the uh, Albany Museum, and it it was actually they had a Native American display that was in one wing of this prominent Capitol building designed by H. Let me think. I think it was H. H. Richardson who may have designed this. But at any rate, they had a cataclysmic fire in around. I think it was around 1901, and the Mohawk of the uh, Hudson Valley all said, well, you guys had those false faces there and you had them in these glass cases and you were honoring them with ceremony. And the, the false faces, you have to sort of look at them like they're living beings and apply the same etiquette. Like you wouldn't walk into a pub or a party and just stare at somebody and point at them and laugh at them. And you wouldn't do that with a living person. Well, you shouldn't do that with a false face. And if, if they're in a museum where people are going by walking, looking at them, this is disrespectful. It's going to activate... You know the orenda um, that that's within them, and it's you just don't know which way it's going to go. So I think that may be what you're uh, referring to, Barbara. Oh yeah, and and they did contact the nation they belong to, and and someone came and took some of them, but not all of them. But then they made arrangements, and, and within the next year, they they took all of them back. I think you're referring to a story from the Onondaga region. Um, it was Mike, Mike Bastine, one of his best friends of his life was Ted Williams. And, and Ted told me this story. Um, do you remember that one, Mike, that, that Ted was in the museum at, I think, Onondaga, or wait, Oneida. I think it was at Oneida. But anyway, he yeah, walked, there was, was a Oneida. display of false faces, and he walked up to them, and he addressed them, and he said, you'll be home soon. And within a year, they were back with uh, the nation. Yeah, they really, truly are treated like like living beings, like living, sentient beings. And people that are not in the Iroquoian society and, you know, basically Westerners, people that have been raised with our mindset, we, it's just something we don't get. But, um, yeah, yeah, you hit, it, you hit the nail on the head there, Barbara. <laughs> Did read the book. Um I think one of the other areas that if we can touch on briefly, I would love to. <clears throat> are you, you? I don't know what you would call them, but they're people who can speak with animals. Um, in some places they're called animal whispers, but in other places they're called other things. And they truly do speak to the animals, which which is is magical and wonderful. Yes, then... Those things can also be very helpful when there are people who are not healthy or are struggling with something in their life. A lot of times the animals can actually assist and help someone get the message to convey the message what needs to be done because Uh the animals actually know what's best for not only themselves, but for the people who they live with. And I know a couple people who do communicate with the animals like that, and they are very good at when someone, even if an animal is not well, the animal Uh can convey to this person what needs to be done to help them overcome their illness or whatever affliction might be bothering them. Sometimes it may not manifest as a physical ailment, but it's a behavioral change, and that can be remedied also through the assistance of the animals. Yeah, I did a long time ago have, for 17 years, a meditation group, and I had four cats at the time. And I always knew who needed the emotional support most because as we got into the meditation, each cat would find a person that in some way, shape, or form needed comfort, and they would be on that person's lap throughout the entire meditation. It was the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. (laughs) 
Oh, well, that's fantastic. And, well, my cats just hide in the closet, so you had nice cats. <laughs> well, um, happily nobody had an allergy, but it was it was so very <laughs> obvious that as soon as the cat sat on the person's lap, they became peaceful, they became tranquil, and they were actually able to do the meditation where they might not have been able to prior. So, and and I never said anything to any of the group. I was just amazed each time. Always someone different. They didn't go back to the same person twice. But it was almost like, you know, I'm giving you some peace. I'm giving you some quiet. Let me help you through whatever it is you're going through. It was magical. Yeah, that's what they're here for. Um, yeah. It's, it's a collective effort between the, the caretakers and the animals know. And that's pretty interesting <clears throat> that I've experienced this throughout my life, um, where you go in and you may be asked to assist with an animal with an injury. Um, mm-hmm. One of the first times that that happened was a wildlife rehab uh, center in East Aurora, and they contacted me and asked me if I could take a look at one of the peacocks that they had. And I said, okay. I said, what's the problem? And they told me there was an infection in one of the feet. And I said, well, I will come up and take a look. And when they directed me to where the peacock was, and I could see, obviously, by she would walk, she favored the one foot. So I just walked over, and I picked the peacock up, and I tipped her back, and I looked at her feet, and the woman who runs the rehab center, she said, do you handle birds on the side? And I said, no, we had chickens when we were kids, but I said, this is the first time since then. And she said, because... The bird lets you walk right over and just pick her up. And I said, well, they know. When you're oh, yeah. going to help them and they need help, they're very cooperative. So when I looked at it, he said, can you help this peacock? And I said, yes. I said, there's a fever in the foot. There's swelling. I said, so there's an infection in there. But what most people don't know is that birds don't generate pups. And the infection needs to be addressed. And I know what a vet would do. They would probably clean the wound and administer an antibiotic. And I told her, I said, that's the improper thing. It's an isolated infection. We just need to treat the infected area. So I told her what I know would work. It looks like a a puncture wound. I said, we'll go get the medicine. I said, I'll go get it. I'll prepare it. And you have to apply it probably two or three times a day. After the first day, the bird was almost back to normal. But they said, the next day, the swelling came back. And I said, I'll be over and take a look. <clears throat> and I said, are you changing the dressing two or three times a day? They said, yeah. So I said, I need someone's scalpel. We opened the puncture just a little bit, and there was a chunk of material in there that looked like um, a kernel of corn, but it had little, uh, like, root like trailing coming off of it, but I got a pair of tweezers, and I removed it, and then they started treating it with the medicine again, and within a day or two, it cleared up completely. That blockage was that little piece in there was blocking the infection from completely coming out. So once that was removed, it, it cleared up completely. 
Well, that is that is amazing. I, I tell I tell people today when they come to the house, the the cats sit, you know sit around and look, and I tell them, you know, just relax. You're just being cat scanned. And uh, <laughs> well, it's true. If if the person is you know, emotionally upset or there's something really wrong with them, the cats won't even be there. But if the cats sit around and take a look and then go back to what they were doing, then they're, they're okay. So I know the energy of the house is okay. It's, it's, um, you got, heal- it's you got healing cats. Yeah, I do. I That's do. That's great. I got hiding cats. They just run. <laughs> no, my, my cats are very into everything. They decide to put themselves in the middle of it every time they can. Matter of fact, usually when I do radio shows, I have one or two of them sitting up here, and often I, when I'm typing, one of the cats decides to type for me, and it's, I, I appear unintelligible for a while. Ah, I've, I've got a file of, uh, of one of my cats loves to get up on the laptop. I've got a file of her literary expressions. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, they are unique creatures, and I adore them. Um, I, I had one time I had 12, which is too many, but, um, <laughs> I'm down, da- I'm down to three now. You sound like crazy cat lady. <laughs> I, I have been called that actually. Um, but, but, uh, you know, you're I probably going to get your the... medicine mask and come after me now. <laughs> I'll tell you something. I, I can't turn down a litter. You know, it's, it's, you can't take yeah. just one. You have to take them all. So I try to I, I try to stay away from places that have litters of cats that need to be adopted. But I'll tell you, you guys I would have, have been, trouble turning it on a kitten too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know they'll find good homes as kittens, but it's just so hard to turn them down. It's like, oh, I could just, you know, it, it it's terrible. So I stay away as best yeah. I can. I have three, and I can afford to take care of them, and so that's where we are now. Um, but guys, you have been so fabulous. Like Mark, you know this is your show. You can come back in here. You have two minutes, to, so tie yourself up. Uh, okay. Go for uh, it, Mark. Come on, don't be nervous, buddy. You can do it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike and Mason. And do either one of you have some upcoming appearances? I have a couple things pending, but nothing has been solidified. The only one that I know of that is for sure is the last weekend in April. I will be out in um, uh, Memorial Camp. It's a white memorial camp. It's Council Grove, Kansas. It's where the Wisdom Keepers organization meets with Native Elders. And I will be out there on the last weekend in April. I don't have a calendar in front of me. I think it's 26th, 27th, 28th, around in that area. But whatever is the last weekend in April, uh, they are holding another gathering in uh, Council Grove, Kansas. And it's open to the public. So if anyone wants to Google that or check it out, they can find more details and who to contact to make arrangements to to be there. And we have similar conversations, just like we had tonight here, about integrating the the old teachings to bring them these concepts into modern times and apply them, and they they still work. So yes, it's thank you for the opportunity tonight to share these uh, experiences, and hopefully the audience will get from this things that will assist or help them through the journey that we're sharing on this planet. Okay, okay. and, and uh, Mason, we're down to about thirty seconds. Uh, you, you can get the yes. The, I- I- Iroquois my, Supernatural. My, you can get it with uh, in, Inner, Inner Tradition Traditions. International. And my next appearance, my ego and I are going to head down to a pub tomorrow night. So <laughs> that's my next appearance, both of us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Time to say goodnight, Mark. 